morning, First Christian Church. Um, I'm on 20, Michael. You want to make this just a little hotter for me? That'd be wonderful. A couple of things I want to mention this morning. Um, Wednesday nights have been really lovely. Uh, we just have had, we had a really interesting discussion this past Wednesday night about Mary, about her role in bringing forth baby Jesus, and why, why God chose someone like Mary. It was just, it was a really neat conversation. Uh, we really, I just, I think everyone here was just really blessed Wednesday night with the video series. This Wednesday night, um, we're not going to be meeting because it's the week of Thanksgiving. We want to give folks a chance to get ready to spend time with family and friends. We'll be back together the following Wednesday. But we did get an, a picture, and I don't know if Michael will be able to find this, but we've had, um, while we're downstairs doing our video series, Stephanie's been upstairs with our children and youth. And they had a chance to uh, make these stockings they're holding up. And these stockings uh, are obviously headed off um, to go for our shut-ins at the nursing home also. And so it was a great project, a great outreach for them. And it, you know, just an encouragement, again, for families to you know, bring, your, bring your children, bring your youth. Meanwhile, while we were in the sanctuary and Stephanie was upstairs, Emily was downstairs with our young adults and they were having a very interesting conversation, which I think all of us in this sanctuary would love to have been a part of, about some of the issues related to the Palestinian conflict we're seeing overseas. And these, uh, these conversations um, are just wonderful conversations where I, th there's a lot of questions that are being brought up. And, and Emily is guiding, uh, I think, a much more mature conversation with folks that I know the youth and the young adults really appreciate a more in-depth opportunity for a conversation. So um, if you wanted to pretend to be a young adult, you should go down there and just go in there and say, like, I'm here, I want to have a conversation. Um, but it just shows, I think, how hungry we are as people of faith to have some of these kind of conversations. And, and it really is something that uh, Emily's kind of precipitating for us in that group. We've got some of these young adults here with us uh, tonight and uh, today, and Emily's going to talk to us a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, so before we recognize the young adults, I want to take a moment. We have a couple of special Olympic athletes with us in worship today in the back here with their medals. So let's give them a round of applause. Congratulations on your success, and thank you for being here and, and sharing with us um, your stories. Thank you so much. Today, as Dan mentioned, uh, is Young Adult Sunday. It's the first ever where our young adults have come together um, in this last year, my first year of ministry. Um, one of my passion projects has been to get young adults together. It's an age group that is so often forgot about when it comes to ministry. Um, people graduate high school and they go off and then they're forgotten about a little bit. Um, so we've been very intentional about bringing young adults into this space and today into our worship setting. So we are gonna be blessed by their gifts and talents and I'm excited to see what happens. Let's worship together. Would you join me in singing, This is the Day? to this holy day. We come to offer thanks. We come to sing and pray. Welcome, friends, to this time set apart. A time to remember those we love and time to remember the holy promises of God. Welcome, friends, to this table of remembrance and joy. The table where we are fed, the feast we share with many. 
Welcome, friends. Let us worship God. Let's worship to God together in our opening hymn, We Gather Together. Would the children like to come join me for children's moments? So, one day, Jesus got up early and went to the temple. 
And as often as that happened, a group of people gathered around Jesus, and he sat down and he began to teach them. As he was teaching, some teachers of the law brought a woman who had been living a sinful life and made her stand before Jesus. Teacher, they said, this woman was caught in a terrible act of sin. The law of Moses says that she should be punished by stoning. What do you say? The Bible tells us that they were trying to trap Jesus into saying something against their laws so that they could bring charges against him. Jesus bent down and began writing with his finger in the dirt. The men kept questioning Jesus, trying to get him to say something. Finally, Jesus stood and said to them, Whoever is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he bent down and continued writing in the dirt. The men who had accused the woman looked at one another and walked away. And Jesus stood and spoke to the woman, Where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you, he asked? No one, the woman answered. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Have you ever seen someone doing something wrong and you pointed a finger at them, maybe like tattled on them to like a teacher or something? Yeah, I've done it too. I think that most of us would have to admit that we have. So, you know when you point your finger at someone? Can you point your finger? Do you see you have three fingers that are pointing back at you? So maybe instead of pointing the finger at somebody else, you should just like see that we all do bad things sometimes, you know? And that's the point of Jesus' teaching in our lesson today, that not everybody is perfect, and we should remember that when we want to point fingers or throw stones at someone else. Will you pray with me? Dear God, Help us to have the forgiving attitude that Jesus taught us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then you can go line up for chapel. Dear Heavenly Father, as we go forward with today, please help guide us and help us to not condemn others who may be struggling with sin. For we are all sinners, made new in Christ. Lord, help us to represent you and your unconditional love, for for we are all your children. Help guide us to encourage rather than condemn. Help us to love rather than judge. Please present opportunities this week for us to lead others to you rather than away from you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us unconditionally and for giving us your son so that we can have a relationship with you. In your name I pray, amen. Amen.
Good morning. morning. That was beautiful, guys. That was fantastic. (laughs) Um, So our reading today will be from John 8, 1 through 11. Then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? They said, they said, they said this to test him, so that they might have some charges to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your, go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of the Lord. One thing I love about the gospel, the good news that is for all people, that God loves us, is that we can find the gospel truly anywhere. Pastor Dan and I are both avid readers, and we have an ongoing back and forth about what kind of books are best to read. Now, Pastor Dan claims that nonfiction books are the books that are actually worth reading. He gets confused by how I could be interested in fictional stories when there are so many amazing and true stories out there to discover, and I do see his point. There is certainly a different kind of weight in a story when what happened actually happened. However, I love fiction. I love it. The fact that you can immerse yourself in a story in an entirely different world with people who have never existed, that you can have emotional reactions and attachments to characters, that you can experience all of that as a product of someone else's imagination, that they have created and you are inside their creation. One thing in particular that I love about fictional stories is that you can find moments of the gospel in them. Since we are all created in the image of God, We have never lived in a world without God. Because of that, there are echoes of God in the stories we have, fictional or true. Now, my husband Alex gets a little confused sometimes because we will be watching something like a zombie TV show. And he will look over and I will be crying. And he's like, Emily, how can you cry at a time like this? And I'm like, can't you see it? Can't you see the love of Jesus in this story? And he looks at the screen with zombies on it. And he's like, "Uh uh-huh, right. (laughs) We find the gospel in the most unexpected places. There are so many opportunities around us to see it if we are open to it. In our story for today, the Pharisees and the religious leaders were so caught up in their own scheming that they missed the gospel right in front of them. They couldn't see the good news sitting before them, riding in the dirt. Jesus was teaching a crowd of people when the religious leaders came forward, dragging a woman with them to be judged by Jesus. She had committed adultery, and the Pharisees and religious leaders see this as an opening. They weave their web and set Jesus up in front of everyone. They say, 
The law of Moses says we should stone her for what she has done. But what do you say we should do? And scripture even says this was a trap. Here they are hoping he will say the wrong thing so that they can condemn him. It's really Jesus on trial here. Jesus finally gives his famous line, let any one of you who was without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And everyone leaves except the woman who Jesus talks to, refuses to condemn, and sends on her way. You've got to read the book of John, by the way. It's great. John has examples of what we call sassy Jesus. Sassy Jesus furiously flips tables outside of the temple when people are trying to profit off of a house of worship. Another time, some Jews pick up rocks to throw at him, and sassy Jesus says, oh, which of the good things that I've done, which of those things are you stoning for exactly? And sassy Jesus offers the challenge in scripture today. If you think you are so much better than this woman, go ahead, pick up a stone. Jesus sees through their schemes, sees through the show they are putting on, and sees their hearts. The justice of God is not something that we should weaponize against others. And that is exactly what these Pharisees and religious leaders are trying to do here. And they're doing it with the price of this woman's life. Not only have they misunderstood the mercy and grace of God, but they have done so at the expense of another human being. This woman is nothing more than a political prop to them. They have reduced her to nothing, and they want to use public violence against her body just to make a point. They pull her in front of everyone and announce her shame. She's a woman. Who cares about some woman? And she sinned even better. She's nothing to them. But Jesus reminds them that she is them. If they're going to reduce her to her sin, then Jesus has no problem reducing them to theirs. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Or, We could translate it to, if you want to put her on trial, guess what? All of you will have to go on trial too. Sometimes we feel so justified in our righteous anger that we don't love the person in front of us. And that is the sin of these Pharisees and religious leaders in this story. And you know what? That is the sin of us sitting here today and standing at this pulpit, too. On Wednesday nights, like Pastor Dan mentioned, I lead a faith formation group with the high schoolers and the young adults. We gather together, I present information on a topic that the group has requested, and then we have discussion. We've looked at questions like, does hell exist? And What are the negative consequences of mission work? And what is happening right now in Israel and Palestine? And recently, we had a discussion on how involved should the church be in politics? About eight of us on all sides of the political spectrum sat together and wondered about God and church and political parties and the state. Now, this group is incredibly smart. They ask amazing questions. They bring great perspective. I leave Wednesday nights constantly feeling like I just learned something new and exciting. But there is one thing particularly special about it. A congregant approached me and a few of the folks who attend that group, and this person said, wow, I really commend you 
that you all are able to get together and do that, to sit in a room together, to disagree with each other, and be able to talk about those things in today's time is amazing. This comment hints at a truth that is really heartbreaking, that we can't talk to each other anymore. We, just like the Pharisees and the religious leaders, often idolize our political ideas. We want to hold on to our party's stance or the words of a politician more than we want to love and serve the people around us. When we get into that Facebook argument, when we comment something insulting on someone's TikTok video, we are falling into the same pattern of holding on to our anger, justifying our actions and forgetting about love. Thanksgiving is this week. Uncomfortable political conversations at the dinner table, subtle judgments over parenting choices, not so humble bragging about recent purchases, all of it. This time of year is hard for a lot of people. When you feel yourself beginning to tense up because of a comment you disagree with this Thursday, you can tell them you disagree. You can have a conversation about your differences, but remember these words from Jesus today. Do not throw those stones at your family member, your friend, your neighbor, unless you first are without sin. I found a really compelling imagining of what the experiencing for this woman, what the experience would have been like for her, and I'd like to read it to you. From the blog Daughters of Eve, it says, She was viciously snatched, brutally yanked through the streets, shoved to the middle of the crowd, whispers in her ears, shouts even louder, forced to stand, terrified. When they presented her to Jesus, her muscles tense and braced, staring at the ground, shaking, waiting. Waiting to feel the first stone meant to draw blood. Did she see the rocks being dropped to the ground? Falling and not thrown. Did she flinch when the younger ones angrily threw theirs to the ground in disgust? Jesus stood to address her just as he stood for the Pharisees. And for the first time she is given dignity. This is God's way toward us, you and me, toward this woman. Dignity while yet we sin. Can you imagine the look in Jesus' eyes? Such tenderness, such love, such sorrow for us sinners who try so hard to find life and love in earthly things. Now there's one strange detail in this story that might be easy to overlook. It doesn't have any impact on the plot, but the scripture says that Jesus is riding in the dirt. As the charges are brought before him and the Pharisees and religious leaders are getting all puffed up, Jesus stoops down and starts riding or drawing in the dirt. Now, of course, Scholars have debated on what he was writing for centuries. There are plenty of theories, but some scholars don't even care what Jesus was writing because they have their own theory. Their theory is that it wasn't about intimidating or dismissing the accusers. It wasn't about some power play or showing disinterest in their game. They think that just maybe Jesus stooped for this woman. That in her moment of shame and embarrassment, this moment of being used to fit some agenda, that Jesus stoops down into a humble position to be there for her. Jesus sees this woman 
He cares for her, and he will not let her endure this alone. This is the promise that is for all of us. That when we have to reckon with the things that we've done, the mistakes we have made, when we feel that the world is against us, when judgment looms nearby, we will be met with grace, with mercy, and with love. God came down here as Jesus for humanity. Jesus went down there into the dirt for her. Surely, he is down in your mess with you now. Finally, there's a powerful quote from William Barclay about this story. He's talking about the religious leaders and the Pharisees, and he says, They knew the thrill of exercising power to condemn. Jesus knew the thrill of exercising the power to forgive. May we all be more Christ-like, leaning into forgiveness more often than condemnation. Church, the gospel is all around us. It's in the walls of this church. It's on zombie TV shows. It will be at your Thanksgiving table. It is in your very DNA. Maybe we could all do ourselves a favor and get out of our own way so that we can see it. Amen. Like I mentioned, this young adult group has been getting together in this last year. We've sat at many tables, as you may have seen in our slideshow. We've sat around tables to play games, to eat food, to have meaningful conversation, to have silly conversations that none of us can even remember anymore. We have gathered in this last year, and I am so grateful that we get to gather together again here today as we take communion. So let's take communion together. Everyone is welcome. pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we receive this bread, we recall your son's body broken for our sake. We are humbled by the depth of his sacrifice and the boundless love that led him to the cross. May this bread serve as a reminder of the redemption we find through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Will you pray with me? Dear God, during this time of communion, please help us remember the sacrifice you made for us. Help us wonder about ways we can sacrifice ourselves for you, whether that is with our time, money, or talents. Amen.
invite you to join with me in these words from Scripture. For I receive from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and blessed it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again with these words from scripture. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may be seated. Thanksgiving is a time when perhaps your family has this tradition. I know mine does. You go around the table, say one thing you're thankful for. Maybe that turns into a couple things you're thankful for. The children roll their eyes, but secretly they love it. The adults might roll their eyes too, but everybody actually loves taking a moment to say what you're thankful for. And we have so much to be thankful for. This church has a mission to reach out to those in need. Not only do we try and care for ourselves, but we then reach out into our community to help others. So help us make an impact with your gift today. And let's watch this video together to wonder, we know this table is big enough to include everyone, but is our table at home? Let's take up our morning offering. I booked these tickets weeks ago. How does this happen? Sir, we have a lot of factors going on, and besides that, I can't control What about another flight? I'll, I'll take a red-eye or an early morning flight. Sir, as I've explained, there is nothing else available. What's your name again? Judy. Judy. Judy, there has to be ways around this. Sir, I've already told you. We checked the schedules, scoured the schedules. The flight time, to get sir, there is home. nothing left. Can I, can I talk to your supervisor? I know, I know there's someone above you. I don't mean that disrespectful. There has to be someone above you. Can I speak to that person? I sat on this phone. I sat on this phone for an hour and a sir, half. Sir, you're in luck. You're talking to the supervisor. You're the supervisor. Then Absolutely. okay. Then okay. Are you, are you close to your mom, Judy? I don't feel comfortable discussing my family with you. I didn't mean it that way. I'm just saying, Judy, I... I have to get home, I have to, my mom, okay, my mom, my mom has had the roughest year and I have to get home. Sir, I realize this is an incredible inconvenience for you, but there is nothing we can do. So you're saying I'm spending Thanksgiving alone? That's what you're saying, that's what, is that what you're saying? That I'm spending Thanksgiving alone? Just say it, say it for me, that I'm spending Thanksgiving alone. There's nothing you can do. With all due respect, sir, you are not the only person spending Thanksgiving alone. Help you? I um, got your. Oh, uh. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, come on in. Yeah, uh, great. I'm so, oh, Fred, okay. Uh, thank you. Go ahead and have a seat. Sorry, oh. someone decided to take a late nap. No problem. You want to give them the flowers? Oh, these are for me? Thank you for having oh, us. No. Uh, make yourself at home. Great, thanks. Okay. Oh. Hi. Hi. Oh, wow. You brought, this is so great. Hello, welcome. Oh, you got pizza. That's awesome. Yeah, oh, that was I love that. Thank you. That's, oh, they're hot, too. Hi. Coffee shop. What you just say? I'm sorry, but what I said is that you're not the only person alone this Thanksgiving. So, how long does it take to cook a turkey? Holy God, we want to thank you for these gifts, for these offerings. We know that you give us so much blessing, God, and we faithfully return those blessings back to you, trusting that you will use them for the good of our church, for the good of our community. God, please bless this gift back into your management. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn of invitation is a time when we invite forward. If you need special prayer, if you'd like to transfer your membership, we would love to have you to come forward and join us at First Christian Church. Let's sing our hymn of invitation, Now Thank We All Our God. young adults, Michaela, is going to give our benediction today. Would you all bow your heads with me? Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for creation and how it praises your name. Lord, we ask that you guide us and keep us in your way. Allow us to give thanks in a way that is becoming of you and form us in your character forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 